Hello, everyone. This, web new, this webinar is being brought to you by the American College of Radiology and the ACR Commission on Radiation Oncology Education Committee. Today, we'll be discussing the topic of ra radio pharmaceuticals regarding both established evidence and the process of implementation of a Theranostics program. Please remember to mute your microphones and use the chat feature to submit questions throughout the webinar. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end. I'm your moderator today. My name is Emil Doganani. I am an assistant professor of radiation oncology at Ohio State University. My co-moderator co is Dr. Aaron Bush, who is a PGY4 radiation oncology resident at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Before we begin today, we would like to inform you the ACR designates this live activity for a maximum of one uh, PRA category one credit. Physicians should claim only the credit commiserate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Instructions to receive credits will be published by the ACR RO webpage shortly after the webinar, along with the on-demand recording. In order to successfully complete the activity, participants must complete an activity evaluation and complete credit com commiserate with their participation in the activity. As a reminder, this webinar is part of an ongoing quarterly series where we discuss cutting topics ranging from clinical education to health policy and economics. We provide a link to all webinars at the end of our presentation today. Learning objectives for today's webinar are listed here for review. CME credit details are here and over the next few slides for your reference, which I will skip through relatively quickly. I would like to introduce our panelists for this webinar. The first will be Dr. Freddy Escorcia, who obtained his tri-institutional MD-PhD at Weill Cornell, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Rockefeller University in New York. Dr. Escorcia's thesis, worked in, thesis work involved engineering tumor-targeted antibodies and polymers to deliver cytotoxic alpha particle radionuclide payloads. After he completed his residency at Sloan, he joined the National Cancer Institute, where he currently practices, focusing primarily on gastrointestinal and hepatobiliary malignancies. In addition to his clinical and research focuses, Dr. Escorcia enjoys working with and learning from his trainees, recently earning a Distinguished Mentor Award. The second speaker today will be Ephraim Parent. Dr. Parent is an associate professor at Mayo Clinic and is a dual boarded radiologist and nuclear medicine physician. He received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois under the direction of his research mentor, who I will not insult by butchering his name, and obtained his MD at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His current clinical research projects include imaging neuroendocrine prostate cancer transformation with gallium-68 dotate PET and fluorine-18 flucyclamine PET, and evaluation of intracranial malignancies and radiation necrosis. Um, so, Dr. Escorcia, please take over. Can everyone see the screen okay? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So, <laughs> Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, the invitation to speak today. Of course, the ACR and particularly Dr. Uh, Emil Goginani for the invitation and kind introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a radiation oncologist and scientist here at the NCI. Research interests are in developing radiopharmaceuticals for the imaging and treatment of human cancers uh, with particular interests in cancers of the gut. Uh, I work for the government, so no conflicts allowed. Um, all right, so let me start with a plug. Um, Often reviews with radiopharmaceuticals, on radiopharmaceuticals rather, start at a high enough level, but quickly devolve into jargon that's often hard to follow uh, unless you've been in the field for a while or, or, or you have some prior familiarity. I've been guilty of this, uh, but as part of making amends, uh, we put this primer together for folks to, interested in getting their feet wet. So if that's of interest uh, and you just want to uh, sort of want a place to start, this, uh, you might want to check this out. 
All right, so let's start with the types of therapeutic uh, radiation emissions. Uh, so first we have the beta particle. These are electrons that are ejected from unstable uh, nu uh, radionuclides. The range of these particles is on the order of millimeters, uh, so tissues. Um, and the linear energy transfer, that is how much energy is deposited over that path length, is relatively uh, small. So low linear energy transfer, low LET. Example, nuclides include the lutetium, uh, 177, yttrium 90, samarium, uh, and I-131. Another type of emission that we should know about is the alpha particle, and this is a helium nucleus that is ejected, uh, and the path length is actually much shorter on the order of 100 microns or so, several cell diameters, and the linear energy transfer is relatively large, so it's high LET radiation. It deposits all the energy over a short path length, and that can be particularly damaging uh, depending on where you go. So if it's close to a cancer cell, um, it, it can be particularly potent. Examples include radium-223, actinium-225, and lead-212, which are being explored clinically. Now, uh, before I, I move on and talk about active uh, targeted rate of pharmaceuticals, which is which is what we're really focusing on here for the most part, I want to talk about um, uh, passive ones. So this is iodine, radium, strontium, samarium. These naturally localize to either thyroid tissues, as in radioactive iodine, or bone, respectively. Um, so they don't necessarily need any any tuning for them to go to to where we want them to go with respect to tumor. What I'm talking about here is active targeting, right? So this requires some tumor selective or tumor micro environment selective target. Uh, in our uh, in the cases of the uh, places we're talking about today, it's going to be somatin satin receptor uh, or prostate-specific membrane antigens on, on prostate cancers. And we need a biomolecule or something to bind this target, right? And we have small molecules or peptidomimetics, in this case, uh, uh, the PSMA617 agents. Uh, peptides uh, can serve this octreotate of uh, dotatate fame. Antibody derivatives, including diabodies and many bodies that are being explored clinically, none approved just yet, and full-length antibodies like the anti-CD20 is used for B-cell uh, malignancies. The other component that you need is a linker. This is an oversimplification because you often have a linker as well as a chelating group. Um, uh, and this can include DOTAs. So we know about DOTA Tate that was mentioned earlier uh, in Dr. Parent's uh, research interests. And this is, means be, uh, that we have a DOTA chelator group attached to the uh, Tria Tate peptide. And I'll show an example of that in, the, in a little bit. Radionuclide wise, we have betas and alphas that we talked about earlier. All right, so what are the approved agents and supporting data? Um, so we have the approved uh, radiopharmaceutical drugs listed here. Not all of them are actually commercially available at the moment. So those are grayed out here. We won't really be discussing the uh, uh, radioiodine that has been used uh, since the 1940s for thyroid uh, uh, malignancies and disorders. And we also won't be discussing the liver uh, microspheres, uh, yttrium microspheres that are used for primary and secondary liver cancers. We're really talking about the newer generation of, of agents that uh, initially started here with Zofigo or radium dichloride. So radium, again, is one of these passively targeted agents because it's in the same group as calcium. So it localizes to regions of bony turnover uh, that includes metastases. Um, so this, this, this agent was actually studied in the Alsimka study. It's a phase three study that compared, uh, that took patients with bone-limited metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who were either ineligible for docetaxel or declined it. And they received six injections of radium-223. Uh, in this case, they, they actually dosed it based on uh, the weight of the patient, 50 gigabecquerels um, uh, per kilogram uh, versus placebo. And the results here showed an overall survival benefit, and this resulted in uh, FDA approval um, uh, thereafter. One caveat for this, uh, this agent is that it predates the next generation androgen deprivation therapy agents. The next uh, kid on the block, if you will, is the lutetium dotatate or lutathera. So what, what this is, and I alluded to this earlier, is a modified octreotate uh, peptide. There's a chelating group here. In this case, the earlier versions had an indium. And this is what the images look like. This is uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, the gamma emissions from the indium, and you're looking at a gamma camera. Um, so you can kind of make out that there's some tumors in the liver, maybe a little something here in the mediastinum. The next iteration of, of this agent took the octreotide 
uh, in this case, they swapped out the 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 uh, the chelating group for a DOTA and the and, and the radio metal for a gallium sixty eight, which is a positron emitting agent. So now you have uh, just like previously, you have uh, an imaging agent that can localize to uh, a tr uh, somatostatin expressing tumors, including these neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see the imaging agent. Uh, is better able to resolve these, this mediastinal disease and, and shows you a lot more uh, of, of the liver disease in this patient. So, you know, the, these, these imaging agents are often paired with the therapeutic ones. And if you swap out the gallium for lutetium, which is a beta particle emitter, as we mentioned before, now you have a tumor selective radiotherapeutic drug. So this was tested in the phase three study called the Netter study, where they took patients um, who would otherwise receive octreotide standard care, uh, plus or minus lutetium dotatate. Um, what the study showed in the interim analysis was an overall survival, sorry, progression-free survival benefit and an overall survival benefit, uh, in, like I said, in the interim. Now, one of the things uh, to highlight here is that the final analysis did not show an overall survival benefit that was statistically significant. Authors believe that this was a function of crossover where 36% of these patients uh, in the control arm received lutetium dotatate. But still, the PFS and QOL benefit persisted, and this was reported uh, in the original study and then in the subsequent follow-up here. So again, progression-free survival benefit uh, and quality of life improvement, which is different than what uh, some of the other uh, agents uh, showed previously. Now, the the, the more exciting agent um, that that also came out fairly recently is the, the the PSMA targeting ones. And again, first we'll start with the imaging agents. And here we have uh, the DCFPYL agent F18 or the gallium agent. Um, uh, and and what they share here is this this urea uh, functional group. That 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 is that's uh, that's required in order for this to bind to the prostate-specific membrane antigen expressed on prostate cancers. So the reason why people started uh, investigating this is because prostate cancer, unlike other cancer types, does not routinely take up FDG. Um, so uh, lesions would often be cryptic. So here's the patient uh, being imaged with FDG, and you see uh, this lesion uh, with the PSMA uh, imaging agent. So now we can better. Um, stage our patients and maybe uh, intervene earlier uh, with, with respect to treatments. All right, so now the therapeutic agent, um, we, we still have this urea uh, component to it, and then now we chelate lutetium. And one of the uh, first studies that was done on here that was prospective was out of the uh, Australi Australian and New Zealand group, where they took the agent and compared it to cabazitaxel in patients who progressed after first-line taxanes. These are patients that have metastatic, castration-resistant prostate cancers, and uh, ended up having progressive disease after the initial taxane. The primary endpoint in this study uh, was uh, assessing whether the PSA would uh, have a, a greater than 50% decrease from baseline. And what you can see here in this waterfall plot is that uh, more patients in the PSMA treated group had, uh, had the, the, the greater than 50% reduction from baseline compared to the Kabazi taxol. PFS benefit uh, uh, was also present. And with respect to tolerability, it was uh, fairly well tolerated. One thing I want to highlight here is uh, xerostomia is pretty common with these agents because PSMA is also expressed in the salivary glands, and uh, you can have some toxicity as a consequence. Uh, so it's on target, but off, off the tumor. Thr thrombocytopenia and uh, uh, hematopoietic toxicity is also common for, for these agents. Importantly, though, um, patient reported outcomes did show clini clinically uh, meaningful improvement in quality of life symptoms with uh, the lutetium PSMA agent compared to cabazitaxel. Again, an important metric uh, when it comes to patients. The sort of blockbuster trial here was the vision study. Phase three uh, took uh, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Um, uh, uh, that progressed after the first uh, line taxane, and they compared uh, lutetium PSMA to what they called uh, uh, the, the, the protocol standard of care. And importantly, the standard of care here did not include cytotoxic chemo, and that's a point of um, a, a, a criticism that, that has been uh, um, uh, thrown at this study. The primary endpoints here were overall survival and, and uh, progression-free survival on imaging. Um, the, the imaging-based PFS uh, showed a significant improvement in the lutetium uh, PSMA arm, uh, as well as uh, there was also an overall survival benefit. 
Uh, as far as uh, AEs, the dry mouth is, is still persistent. Again, uh, this is a, an on-target off-tumor, uh, but it was otherwise well-tolerated. And as a consequence, this, this agent was approved by the FDA about a year ago. Um, and this, despite the fact that they were giving a, a, a flat dosing and weren't taking into account uh, patient tumor burden. And that's a foreshadowing of what I'll talk about in, 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 a, in a few. Okay. So one of the last agents I want to highlight here is the uh, uh, radioiodine MIBG agent. Um, so MIBG binds to a neuroepinephrine transporter that's uh, expressed on neuroendocrine tissues, including paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas. Um, what's interesting about this agent is they actually used a dosimetric dose, a planning dose, to assess how much therapeutic dose to give patients. So this was tested uh, in, in, a, in a small phase two single arm uh, uh, published by Dan Prima at UPenn, where they gave high-specific activity agent uh, to, to patients who have advanced unresectable pheo or paragangliomas. Uh, so they, they took patients that had this disease, they did a, a planning dose, as I mentioned, the primary endpoint uh, was a reduction in at least 50% uh, of, of the uh, baseline antihypertensive that the patients were receiving. Again, these, these patients do produce norepinephrine, so they, they require um, uh, uh, control of their blood pressure. Uh, with respect to results, 25% of these patients had a durable reduction in the baseline antihypertensive medication use. And importantly, 92% of the patients that were evaluable had partial response or stable disease as the best objective response within 12 months. This resulted in FDA approval. So, so what's next? Well, first, I think we need to optimize the available agents, right? Um, I alluded to this earlier, personalized asymmetry may be uh, beneficial. Uh, one way to think about this um, is, is to look at a patient, uh, two sets of patients, two different patient types. One, this, this patient has metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, and you can see the burden of disease is much higher here compared to this patient has a low burden of disease. Now, these patients per the trial would receive the same activity injected uh, into them. And you can imagine that the receptors, the, PS the PSMA here would be saturated potentially in this, this low burden disease patient and everything else would just be circulating causing toxicity. The second patient maybe didn't get enough and you didn't saturate. So you could have gi given a higher dose to this patient uh, to, to achieve the maximal benefit. And people are looking at, at, at this. You can also modulate target expression. So let's say your PSMA expression is relatively low. Maybe your somatostatin receptor expression is relatively low. Could we modulate that to get more dose uh, of your radiotherapeutic drug? Um, uh, one of my colleagues here at the NCI is looking at this preclinically and seeing if she can translate this in, into the clinic by uh, using epigenetic modifiers. And she's been able to take tumors that uh, otherwise don't express or have very low expression of somatostatin receptor, increasing it to the point where you might be able to get some therapy. You can also repurpose these the, the existing agents uh, for new indications, right? Uh, obviously, you'd have to test this in, in, in prospective studies uh, and clinical trials. So one example is uh, in, in hepatocellular carcinoma. So this patient uh, has HCC. You can see the hypodense lesion here in the liver. FDG does not uh, get taken up by this tumor. But interestingly, some of these uh, take up uh, PSMA uh, uh, targeting agents. Uh, it turns out that the P PS, the prostate-specific part, is not so prostate-specific. It's expressed on neovasculature and some other tumors. So you could see good uptake here. Perhaps you could test the therapeutic agent in, in, in PSMA-positive, uh, the PSMA therapeutic agent in PSMA-positive imaging uh, patients. And I think combination therapy is also important. I'm not the uh, only person mentioning this, right? We know this: the, the, these radiopharmaceutical therapies are not curative on their own, and they need to be combined with uh, other therapies in order to achieve these cures. So we could combine with external radiation. This is being explored by several several groups, including uh, uh, the, the the group at Hopkins and uh, Dr. Fu Tran, who is there and now is at Maryland. You can look at. Uh, uh, the radiopharmaceuticals with immunotherapy, uh, and this is being explored by uh, several groups, including the group at UCSF. And looking at DNA damage repair inhibitors, it's a natural combination, right? Uh, radiation, these radiopharmaceuticals work by DNA damage. If you inhibit that, perhaps there could be some synergy. Here's a couple of studies looking at lutetium uh, dotatate combined with a laparib, a PARP inhibitor as a radiosensitizer. Uh, here, they're looking at uh, the PSMA uh, lutetium agent 
uh, with with uh, laparib, and of course DNA-PK uh, here with um, uh, lutetium dota tape. Now, another sort of uh, cousin to optimizing existing agents is swapping out the uh, the lutetium expressing agent to uh, for an alpha particle emitter. Remember that alphas are have higher LET; they're potentially more potent. Um, and, and folks are, are exploring this. Uh, one example that, uh, of a, a, a use case is patients who otherwise progress uh, after receiving treatment with lutetium uh, PSMA. So this is an example of such a patient uh, that ended up being able to respond to the actinium PSMA targeting agent. So they're looking at these in prospective studies now. Um, uh, same things being done with Dota Tate. Uh, the group out of India has reported uh, some uh, promising outcomes in patients receiving actinium Dota Tate versus the lutetium Dota Tate agent. Here's a, a modified version of Dota, uh, Dota M Tate, uh, being explored with lead 212. Lead 212 is an alpha particle emitter. Um, and uh, being uh, currently explored in clinical studies, you can see several images of patients the, in the before and the after showing some dramatic uh, radiographic responses. So moving forward, you can imagine uh, uh, new agents going after the same target and there's slight modifications of the agents that we, uh, well, we are, are already familiar with. Now, Emerging agents. So this, this is a risky pop proposition, uh, and because uh, I'll invariably leave somebody's favorite target uh, off. So this is not meant to be comprehensive. So I'll just highlight a couple of the things that uh, are, are exciting. So FAPI, this is a fibroblast activating uh, protein uh, inhibitor. So these are molecules that bind to this protein that's expressed on cancer-associated fibroblasts. Um, a, a publication a couple of years back uh, showed that uh, a FAPI imaging agent was able to visualize up to 28 different kinds of cancers. This is a pan-cancer agent for imaging. Could you explore this on the therapy side by, by changing out the isotope? So in this case, Y90, it's a beta particle emitter. It's therapeutic. Um, and, and, and folks are exploring the, the outcomes for, uh, for such, um, such an agent. Other targets uh, people are looking at are CXCR4, uh, and the agents are Pentixa4 for imaging, Pentixa Ther for uh, therapy. Um, this is expressed in several cancer types, including um, uh, uh, multiple myeloma, in this case, T cell lymphoma for uh, imaging and therapy. Here they're highlighting uh, one case of a patient with this T cell lymphoma, a lot of disease here lighting up on the, the, the uh, CXCR4 PET scan, and then following therapy with the Y90 therapeutic agent, you can see some dramatic uh, radiographic responses. GD2 is a dicyalloganglioside uh, that is expressed on uh, several um, CNS malignancies, uh, small cell lung cancers, and melanomas, and that's being uh, one of the agents is being explored uh, therapeutically. The group at Sloan Kettering um, has also looked at uh, intraventricular uh, treatment with an antibody targeting this this uh, this gangliocide for medulloblastoma. And you can see they they deliver it in the compartment and it actually remains there. You have very little um, uh, uh, spread to the other portions of the body. Then another interesting use case. Uh, this is relatively new, and the the, the final report is not out. But uh, a press release out of the phase three Sierra study looked at an antibody targeting CD45 that's radioiodinated, so a beta particle emitter. And they use this antibody in, uh, as part of a, a, a conditioning regimen prior to bone marrow transplant. And uh, the, the, the initial top line uh, results showed that uh, it met its primary endpoint, showing a, a durable complete remission of six months uh, uh, post initial remission after BMT. Uh, that was superior to the conventional uh, condition arm. So uh, stay tuned for the final report, uh, but I think it's a very exciting use case for that. So with that, I'll summarize. Um, we have radiopharmaceutical therapeutic agents that are available, particularly for prostate cancers and neuroendocrine tumors. And this is all based now on high quality clinical trial data showing either progression free or uh, overall survival benefit and or a quality of life improvement for patients. So these are outcomes that I think actually matter. Um, we need to optimize these agents. Uh, I'm not the only one uh, talking about this. Uh, folks are actively exploring this, which I think is, is pretty exciting. We're talking about personalized dosimetry. Perhaps we can move things in earlier line, looking at combinations, swapping alphas and betas. 
and repurposing existing agents for new indications could be interesting. Maybe uh, other targets are expressing in, in other uh, diseases. I know Dr. Parent uh, has the interest in looking at uh, Dota Tate in neuroendocrine uh, dedifferentiated prostate cancers, and perhaps a therapeutic uh, drug could, could be helpful there. Of course, all this is done in clinical trials. And look, there's many uh, targets, uh, many new targets, many new agents uh, that, that need to be explored in, in, in clinical studies. So definitely stay tuned. This is a rapidly moving space. So with that, I'll finish and I'll uh, let Dr. Uh, Parent uh, proceed. Thank you, Dr. Escorcia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Parent will take over. Feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. In the meantime, okay. we'll summarize them at the end for the speakers to speak on. Thanks. Great, so I'll take over. Let me uh, set up my screen. But in the meantime, I'd like to uh, thank the moderators and uh, the organizers of this for, uh, uh, oops, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Just a second. OK, I think you should see my uh, screen now. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Escorcia, for uh, putting together kind of the framework for what we're going to be doing. So I've been asked to, uh, first I should disclose that I uh, do consult with Blue Earth Diagnostics. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're discussing here. But pretty much everything I'm doing is kind of straight um, clinical practice. And, and the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about is the establishment, how to establish these kind of therapy practice. And, while there's different agents out there, um, I'm going to be talking about PSMA and Lutathera because the application of those are kind of similar. And um, MIBG is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the radium chloride of Zofiga is a little bit different. So just for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to talk about these kind of two new, uh, newer agents that are kind of administered uh, similarly. And then uh, I'll talk very, just very briefly about some ongoing clinical trials and uh, not so much the future directions. Uh, I think Dr. Scorsio took care of that uh, pretty well. So let's first talk about, you know, the, the PSMA, Fluvicto. Um, and, and I'm gonna go about this kind of touching on various points about uh, organizing this. It's not gonna be so much, uh, I'm gonna take you, handhold you about how to draw the, the dose out of the vial and how to count it in your dose calibrator and everything else like that, um, but more kind of a 30,000 foot view about the things you need to be aware of and to uh, have help set up in, in uh, having a successful practice. So uh, to start this out, let's just talk with, you know, the, the day of uh, maybe before the first treatment, what do we need to do? So uh, the patient's gonna come in and typically what we do is, uh, you know, introduce ourselves, explain that we're part of the team, uh, most of the patients that we see are referred from medical oncology, um, that, that you could also be seeing, uh, we could get referrals from urology or uh, radiation oncology, but um, ultimately we do like having somebody that we are coordinating some of the med medical aspects of this, although uh, as nuclear radiology, it's not necessary, but it's just kind of how we do our practice. So when, we, when the patient comes in, I'm going to go over the imaging, uh, we'll talk about the radiation side effects, um, other things that they need to be worrying about, uh, what the potential uh, downstream effects in terms of the, the results that they expect to get. Um, we go over the blood values um, and then kind of have a more uh, targeted uh, physical examination, uh, get some sense from the patient if there are any kind of acute illness that we need to be with before we start the therapy. And the, again, this consult usually takes place immediately the, before, the day before the, the therapy, um, being aware of specifically any type of heart issues, neurological problems, paralysis, things like that. Um, and then ultimately we need a consent. And, and we don't do the consent until the actual day of, but we do talk about it there obviously uh, during our, cons our, our consultation that, with the patients. Uh, the, the things that I've kind of started here are basically before each cycle, it is each patient comes in, we don't do a full uh, consultation, but we do go over each of these things before we have the patient uh, treated for the next time to just make sure that there's been no acute changes or, or anything that would stop us from continuing on with therapy. So let's kind of, Dr. Scorsio did mention these, these contraindications, and, and I think it's important to kind of be aware that 
by and far, these therapies are very well tolerated. Patients are very happy with them. They do not um, uh, have many complications, a little bit of fatigue once in a while, some nausea, but that's very transient and, and not such a big deal. But there are some things that we need to be aware of that the patient um, sometimes is, is frustrated that, that we uh, say that it's not appropriate to treat. Um, one thing that's interesting here is that the contraindications on the FDA package insert say there aren't any. But if you look at the major trials that have been performed, such as the vision, the therapy trial, uh, they actually did have some more appropriate guidelines that I think that, that, that we try to follow and, and also that are kind of more of the European Association of Nuclear Medicine they have kind of put forward. And there, while there is some little bit of, of variations into how these are protocol, I think these are things to at least be aware of the mind of the patients that we are determining if it's appropriate to do the PSMA therapy. One thing is that this therapy takes uh, several months to do um, and more so with the Lutathera. So, uh, you know, we have six cycles of six weeks apart. So this is months that we are gonna be treating these patients. If, if they are not gonna, if we think that they are not gonna have a long life expectancy, that's a different discussion about what we can do. Um, the drug is eliminated preliminary, primarily through the urinary system. So uh, if there's an issue with obstruction or incontinence, that doesn't necessarily preclude it, but we need to be aware of it and see if does this affect how we would uh, administer the drug or consult the patient about how to take care of things. Um, is there any medical or radiation safety risk? Meaning is there a medical issue where patients have a lower threshold for uh, deleterious effects from radiation. Um, that's rare, but it's something to at least be aware of. Lab values are important. Uh, uh, the thing that I'm gonna stress a lot is the, the myelosuppression, which is the one that we see the most. Um, we do need to have renal function, uh, a GFR over 30. Um, most patients uh, have that. We don't see many patients that have any real negative effect. That was a concern, especially with Lutathera uh, when it was first getting started, but Overall people, I think, and, and we're including this, don't see a lot of negative effect upon the kidney function, even though a lot of it's being excreted that way. Um, but we are aware of all these stages before we uh, uh, start therapy. Myelosuppression, anemia is a real concern. Um, even if patients don't have a ton of osseous disease, it still can be affected. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Um, if there's any more acute things like spinal cord compression, uh, you know, they should have uh, emergent radiation therapy or, or whatever needs to be done to take care of those things. This is a, uh, this is not an acute fix something problem. This treatment, again, it's six different cycles, six weeks apart. And so if there's something acute, we need to take care of that first. Um, and while there's not some hard and fast guidelines on this, it is recommended that if they are undergoing chemotherapy or external beam radiation or something else like that, some other like Zofigo, there, there's not a, uh, any specific thing that's gonna preclude them from being able to get treated, but maybe want to give some time to avoid any uh, side effects that the combination of the radiotherapy that we're doing is targeted radionuclide therapy and the other therapies. So again, it's just a discussion uh, with the patient and the referring team to how to best manage this. There are a few organs uh, that have already been talked about that we worry about the radiation. Kidneys we've talked about. It doesn't seem to be that's a big concern for this, but we do want patients to have good renal function because that could uh, affect the uh, biodosimetry and, and the excretion of the drug. Uh, lactable and salivary gland uptake. So patients, if you look at a, a, pet, a PSMA PET scan, you'll see that there's a lot of uptake in the salivary glands. And actually the, that is a concern Ultimately, um, we're kind of just going on with, the, with, with this beta therapy. It probably will become a more of an issue with the alpha therapy because there's going to be more dose distributed there. But for a lacrimal salivary gland uptake, it's there. We worry about like radiation to the cataracts or, or to, to the to, uh, lens. But ultimately, uh, it doesn't seem to be having a, a true uh, adverse event that we are worrying about there. Bone marrow. Again, this is a thing that we are seeing in our practice that is the, probably the biggest concern. And then liver and spleen function. Most adverse events are mild and transient. Uh, patients, most, most of the time patients don't feel anything. They don't have any issues with this. It's, they're just fine. Sometimes there is a fatigue a couple of days after we give the treatment where the body is responding to the radiation therapy, the cells are breaking down. The, but 
overall that goes away fairly quickly. Um, a little nausea, very, very minimal. Unlike the Lutather, which the nausea can be a real problem. Xerostomia, dry mouth, that can be a problem, but usually it's very mild. But again, it's because there's so much radiation that's being deposited in those salivary glands. We do want to be encouraging patients to be aware of that, to be uh, just like with iodine therapy, you know, uh, small sips of water, uh, chewing gum or something like that to get those salivary glands kind uh, of kind of using so we don't have that stasis of, of, the, of the saliva. Um, the bone marrow is the most common uh, adverse event. Um, and this has been borne out in many trials in our own clinical practice. So these are things that we need to be aware of and I'm gonna talk about kind of how to manage that going forward uh, in a little bit. The renal toxicity and the hepatic toxicity, like I said, is not really such an issue. Um, we've even treated patients that have only a single kidney and, and things like that. Um, so bone marrow. So basically, if patients have grade three anemia, they shouldn't be treated, especially and particularly if they had normal marrow and there you see a drop in marrow function after treatment. And it's been pretty clear that if they get to grade three anemia and they were normal before, they should have the dose discontinued. Now, um, what we run into a little bit is sometimes patients are already at this grade two, grade three anemia. And, and those guidelines are a little bit not set in stone. Um, understand that you can permanently affect the marrow uh, by giving the drug to the patients. And um, while there's not clear guidelines for bridging with transfusions, I strongly encourage people to not do that or at least understand the risk that you are just masking this. And this has happened many times where our oncology team says, well, I understand his marrow is down, but can I give him a transfusion? And I'm like, well, you're just masking the problem because what's gonna happen is we already know that we've, he's taken a hit to the functional marrow. It's gonna continue. It doesn't matter how many kinds of transfusion, the marrow can be permanently affected. Um, you can reduce the dose if we're, uh, you know, if we are, have some marrow, but it's better than grade three. And we've done this uh, several times where we've given the, the recommended 80% dose. And I'll talk a little bit about how you have to modulate that as when you order these, and this is discussed, you actually can't um, tailor the, the ordering. Everyone, everyone's gonna get 200 millicuries from, from Novartis. Um, Again, there are some indications that a bridging transfusion can be useful to help people get through the therapies, but I'm gonna say this is, it should be the exception rather than the rule. Um, and, and it should be considered with, with, you should really, the whole medical team, medical team, uh, the treating team should be, have a good discussion as to whether or not this is appropriate. But again, if they had normal marrow and now they have grade three anemia, it's pretty clear that they should not have continued treatment and, and transfusion should not be bridging them to, to continue to be getting treatment. Um, talking about the imaging, clearly uh, you want to have lesions that have high PSMA uptake. Um, one thing that I will talk about that we see, and this is borne out by many trials, that there's a minority of patients that have what's called discordant FDG avid disease, meaning there's a lymph node or something like this that has not really any PSMA uptake, but there's increased uptake on FDG. Um, and when you, when you see lesions that you think could be prostate cancer, but they don't have PSMA uptake, I really encourage people to do an FDG or some other modality to understand if this is a prostate cancer. Because it's clear there, again, this has been borne out on many therapy studies, that patients that have discordant disease, even if it's only a single lesion, will have a much worse outcome. Um, and, and there should be a real discussion with the patient about the futility of treatment. And so this is a hard discussion to have because a lot of patients, you know, they're, they're kind of, at this point, they've been through many different therapies and this is kind of like the last, last gasp at something. And, and it's a hard discussion to have, but, but the data is pretty clear that if they have this disease, they're not gonna do as well. Um, and, and this is even patients, uh, th that was a study that where they compared patients that had outcomes that where they weren't treated, but this study where they had discordant disease, they still treated and they had a much worse outcome. So this is a real thing. Don't discount the PET imaging um, and do look for any sites of disease. We've had uh, bony lesions that have been hot on FDG. We've had pulmonary nodules that we've 
biopsy to prove pre- prostate cancer, and we have said they should not have therapy. And it's a hard discussion, but it's an important one to have so that everybody's on board and, and, and patients feel good about the results that they are going to have. Um, so again, like this would be a good candidate for, for pluvictotherapy. A lot of PSMA avid disease. Yes, there is some FDG disease, but it's all PSMA avid. We're not worried about if it's matching, but it's a discordant. So like this patient here would not be an appropriate patient for therapy. A lot of FDG avid disease, very little PSMA. So hard discussion, but it is inappropriate. There's indications that sometimes this is a transformation after we start PSMA therapy, um, but ultimately there's no real need to, to continue to do even PSMA or FDG therapy, intra-therapy, because there's not really any change in outcomes. Ultimately, once patients have been kind of met for imaging to start therapy, uh, it, I think it's a go fine to go ahead and do all six weeks of, of or six cycles of therapy before more imaging is done. Unless, of course, there is indications that therapy is not being effective, PSMA continues to rise up. Not sorry, the PSA uh, continues to, to go up. And then at that might it might be good to be doing an FDG or a PSMA to see what's going on and, and maybe reevaluate the utility of, of treatment. Um, we talk about the RAD safety instructions. So again, now let's go, go back to we're consulting with a patient. We've talked about the things we were about, the adverse events, the RAD safety. We talk about very briefly. We talk about that the patient is getting a benefit from the radiation, but the close family and friends are not. And so we give them kind of timelines to be able to give them a close approximation to allow the radiation to kind of wash through and be eliminated before they're safe around people. Um, and, and that could be a longer, longer conversation, um, but for the sake of purposes, we're gonna keep moving on. Okay, the actual therapy, we're now doing the therapy. So they come in, it's about a three, four hour stay very briefly. Uh, the nurse uh, tech are gonna be placing the lines we there initially during the vision trial, people were looking at ice packs and stuff like that, found it not really useful. We do encourage oral hydration. We do not do IV hydration for PSMA therapy. Um, and again, we talk about all those things. Each of our patients are coming in where the rooms are prepped uh, so that if they are incontinent or other stuff like that, it's not making a big radioactive mess for the room, but it's something that, that the paper can be uh, 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 collected and, and, and not really uh, have a big mess. When patients come in, uh, like I said, we, we get the vitals and everything else according to the guidelines. Um, you can give about up to a liter of fluid and, and uh, we don't give diuretics, we don't give laxatives, uh, we don't do the ice packs. It's pretty simple. Patients come in with single IV um, and, and, and give this stuff. The, uh, this is a box of kind of what we do. There's three acceptable methods for delivery. One is the syringe method. And I know like UCSF, this is what they do, um, where they basically draw the, the dose out of a syringe and then the tech uh, in the shield can give it manually. Um, that can be useful, especially after reduce the dose, because like I said, all you're gonna get from Novartis is, is, is a vial that you're gonna have to draw out. You can't custom order it. So if you're gonna reduce it down to 160 millicuries, there's gonna have to be some way to manipulate it. The syringe method is easy, but your tech does get a heavy, hefty dose. The vial method, um, which is very peristaltic infusion pump, we don't do that. I don't really know anybody that does. We use the gravity method. It was simple to adapt from what we were doing with the Lutifera. Um, and it is simply, it, it's, it's an ease and, and there's not really any problems with that, that we have encountered. Patients get six weeks uh, between each cycle. Um, we do sometimes uh, actually routinely do scans. And this is kind of what I want to talk about. So the, this is a PET imaging and this is a patient that we treated um, recently, and and we typically do the full body uh, for for the pay, for the reason I kind of had a technical issue, but I like this study because this is the spec imaging. So we were imaging the PSMA uh, drug that we had injected, and and this does a couple things. So with with the newer um, spec cameras, uh, you actually can get an SUV value similar to you do with PET, and it's not exactly the same thing. It's not like if I get a SUV on PET it should be the exact same thing on the spec imaging. But it allows us or the different cycles of therapy to be able to see how much accumulation of the uh, pluvicto is being incorporated into each lesion. And that can tell us how effective the therapy is gonna be. 
also, it is really the only imaging that you need to do to see if there's new lesions popping up or if there's something else changing. So this is actually something that is a reimbursable study. We do it 24 hours after the, uh, the Pluvicto administration. Um, and most of our patients are very excited to be able to get a sense of how effective their therapy is going on. Um, and I could talk about more of this more in questions, but it, it's, a, it's a neat tool that we can use, minimal radiation. We're not injecting anything else, but we're just basically real-time tracking to see how effective and where the drug is going to. Um, again, you want to do this typically 24 to 48 hours. That come, there comes into some of this reimbursement issue that I really want to get into if you do it the same day. Um, but, but typically, I think this is a lot of places are doing this kind of spec imaging, spec CT imaging. It can be used for dosimetry. I'm not going to really talk about dosimetry much uh, today, other than it has been shown that if lesions get less than 10 gray, the effectiveness of therapy goes down. And, and we can't tailor the dose to maximize this, but possibly in the future we will. And then having that ability to actually get the symmetry for how understanding how much radiation is going into a tumor and how much we can maximize it and keep a safe uh, radiation dose to those critical organs I've talked about will be very useful. There's still some questions here. Uh, Fixed dosing, dosimetry, like I talked about, can you combine it with immunotherapy, other sensitizers, hormonal therapy? Um, there's a lot of work on this for the sake of time. We don't really have time to talk about it. Can we move this up? And that's a lot of where clinical trials are, a lot of work is going on right now. And I'll talk about it at the end of this. Again, we talked about alpha therapy. All these things need more uh, information. I'm gonna move really quickly now to Lutifera. So uh, we already talked about Lutifera. What are the main differences if we're doing this? So if you can do Pluvicto therapy, you can do Lutifera therapy with some work. If you're already doing Lutitherapy, the Pluvicto is easy. It's much easier. The, the Lutifera has more issues. Um, you are giving amino acids uh, for four hours, and there's a lot more nausea. And then also patients are getting the somatostatin therapy afterwards. For the sake of time, I can't, I don't have time to go over the whole thing, but I want to talk about a few areas. Nausea, the patients do have nausea most of the time with this. We give them all antiemetics um, routinely when they come in. Sometimes it's really severe if they have bowel or other involvement. Um, again, that's a difference from the pluvicta where nausea is really not a thing. We don't give antiemetics, but we do for every single patient that has Lutifera. Fatigue is much more common. Again, that is about one to three days after administration and improves over time. And, and myelosuppression is also the most common severe side effect. Unlike with prostate cancer, there is less of a, an involvement there because there is less neuroendocrine disease that is in the skeleton compared to prostate cancer. Um, again, this is kind of the guidelines from the FDA uh, package insert. We follow this, we give the antiemetics, we start the amino acids, for all of our patients, they're coming in with two lines. You're gonna have a line that's going to your amino acids that's going before and after your therapy. And then you have your line for your actual uh, uh, Lutifera injection. Um, all of the same things we need to be aware of and to whether or not we should reduce or continue uh, treatment. Again, just follow those guidelines that are in there. Understand also that the timing of the actual administration of the drug is, a, is 30 minutes versus 10 minutes. Um, so it's a much longer day. They're in the actual chair getting the amino acid solutions for at least four hours. Um, and so then that comes issues with having to use the facilities as well. Uh, we always use the gravity method for this. It's, it gives a nice, slow, uh, uh, consistent date that we do have the infusion pump going to monitor how much we're doing. Um, and understand because they're getting so many fluids, they're getting liters of fluid over a long period of time, they're going to be using the facilities. They're going to have to go to the bathroom. So we always have them, once they're getting the amino acids in, before we give the Lutifera, we, we, we get them up, go to the restroom, empty their bladder, and then we do the Lutifera. And we tell them, don't move, like try to, don't move uh, when we're giving the Lutifera. It's a longer period of time. Don't move your arm. Don't talk to us with your arms. Um, after the Lutifera, you can go back to the bathroom, but for those 30 minutes, we're going to keep you, the, we're going to keep you in your chair, um, and, and because we don't want to lose that line or have any type of, uh, um, uh, extravasation or anything else like that. So this is the thing that needs to be aware of. And again, it's talking to patients, because a lot of these patients have, uh, bowel issues and other things like that, that you need to be aware of. And so it's a longer day, more patient care, because there's more of a 
to the drug. Okay, really briefly, I have uh, two minutes here. There's a lot of therapy trials out there. I'm not going to go over them a whole lot. I want to talk about a couple that I think are kind of exciting with Pluvicto. Um, the PSMA4 uh, just got um, the results just came out from that. So what this was is that they are using the Pluvicto and it's can we use this earlier on? So right now with Pluvicto, you are treating patients that are basically on the third or fourth line. They've failed hormonal therapy, they failed taxing therapy, and that's how they qualify for it. For this, for the PLEA-SMA4 is yes, they're on a, a androgen uh, uh, inhib inhibitor, but can we treat them now? And how does that, how did they do on that versus changing it? And, and they had good results. Um, they didn't have any safety findings, but it is, it is good evidence that there may be a role for increasing or, or, or treating patients with pluvictal earlier on in the therapy. The trial that's still going on, that, and we're part of this, is the PSMA addition trial. This is actually saying, hey, can we even do it earlier, where we're going to be treating patients if they meet our radiographic criteria with PSMA therapy before hormonal therapy, before chemotherapy, and, and there's a few other caveats with, ex, uh, with radiation therapy and things like that. But basically, as a first-line therapy, can PSMA have a good effect? And so that's what we're looking at right now. So these are things that eventually could possibly even increase the numbers of patients that would be getting this drug if it has good results, where they don't have to wait for years of different therapy to be able to be qualifying for this. Um, there are trials going on with Dotatate. There's not as much. They're looking at with meningioma. I know um, at Mayo Rochester, we're looking at that. Um, also looking for like prostate cancer as this has increased uptake uh, with Dotatate as well. In brief, I was talking a lot, um, but these therapies are pretty easy. You do have to be aware. Don't be cavalier about these trials, but once you get it set up with enough time and attention to detail and a good technical team, it's, I think these can be uh, just, you know, enacted pretty much made, same everywhere. As long as you have your uh, dedicated rooms and other facilities for it. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, patients like these, these therapies. And um, uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, save some time for uh, questions. Right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Parent and Dr. Escorcia. Those were fantastic and highly educational. Uh, we would now like to open up the discussion for audience Q&A. After we conclude, please, please visit our ACR Radiation Oncology webinar page to see this webinar and past webinars on demand. And please consider joining the ACR for future content as details will be provided in follow-up survey. So let me just stop sharing. Dr. Parent was very, sorry, excuse me, Dr. Escorcia was very nice to answer many of the questions as they were coming in during Dr. Parent's discussion. And so feel free to review those and the answered questions. A couple have now popped up that were new. Um, so I'll address, well, Dr. Escorcia, you can take this one. The, three the six month prognosis being a prerequisite for treatment makes me wonder if the dosing interval time should be studied to understand how much the dosing interval should be condensed or the first dose to be safely maximized. Yeah, I mean, all these things could be studied. They have the interval that, that was selected that's approved. I mean, the challenge, right, is that if for you to change the SOP, uh, it, 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 it goes against what the package in, insert shows, right? So uh, I, don't, I don't know how many people are, are going to try to do that without studying this actually prospectively. I don't know if Dr. Parent has another um, comment. It, it needs to be looked, I mean, this is, a, this, is a, this is a question. I mean, like this is a bigger part of how do we come up with 200 millicuries? Um, this is uh, something that they came up with. So Lutathera was eight, they did it, shortened it to six weeks, but it's not like there is a big trial where like, well, let's look at four, six versus eight. This, we're at the very beginning stages, right? There, this is gonna be going on for years to treatment. I would, I personally think that there is a good chance we're gonna be treating patients much earlier in the disease process. And if we can shrink down the treatment time, uh, you know, I think it's gonna be good, but we need data and, and it's just gonna, it's just trials are gonna have to happen. And, and unfortunately, these are, 
I'll just say these trials are really expensive. Um, each drug, you know, you're looking at 50K. And so it, at this point, really, I would say that outside of a large, well-funded trial, Novartis, if we're talking about these, these are both drugs by Novartis, it, it's going to have to be some co collaboration with Novartis because as an in, in, as an individual researcher, it's not something that I'd be able to do. Yeah, great points. And many of the questions that were already answered by Dr. Scorsia were similar in kind of challenging the status quo and wanting to accelerate the the use and you know advancement of these of these treatments and obviously you know in the end we all rely on prospective data before we can change management uh, next question how do you manage extravasation if it does happen dr parent uh, I, i'll cover this um so you don't i mean no, i mean like don't <laughs> let it happen uh, that's, that's it. That's it, it, This is a challenge. Um, so I'm not aware of where we've had any case of where it is. I, I, and I want to, I know I'm not answering the question, but make sure the patients aren't using that heart arm to talk. Like everybody wants to talk like this. I do the same thing, but like, that's why I'm in that room and like, don't talk. Like I'll, I'm happy to talk to you. You can keep talking to me. We'll talk about football, baseball, I don't care, but don't gesture with that arm because it, if it blows, that's an issue. You can get radiation necrosis. Um, there's not really a lot of literature about um, what happens with this exact thing, but we do know with other times of extravasation that you can have an effect. So you're dumping basically radiation in the arm. I don't think that it's something that is, there, there's no acute treatment for this. You're basically going to be watching it um, and monitoring it, documenting the extravasation. Uh, I would say if you notice it blowing in the middle of your treatment, you should stop the treatment. Um, but once it's in, there's not like some magical thing that you can do. It's going to be watching, waiting, probably having the patient follow up with, uh, you know, uh, dermatology and, and, and it, it's, it, it's not going to be an easy thing. Hopefully, like I said, we haven't had anything that we have noted. I'm not aware of anybody else that's really had issues. The best thing to do is to just try to make sure that doesn't happen. Use good veins. Don't do it in the hands. Um, you do everything you can to make sure that that doesn't get lost, that you don't extravasate, because not only is your therapy going to be less effective, but you could have some radiation necrosis in that site. And I think now it, it might ha have to be reported to the NRC, whereas before it wasn't, right? Yeah, and this is where it's, it, 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 how much, how do you quantify this and everything else like that, right? You're going to have to follow it. You're going to have to document these things, but it, it started, we're getting in this gray area. Um, and I don't want to take a whole lot of time about monitoring this stuff, but be aware of it. Don't be cavalier about it. But yeah, there's not, a, there's not an easy answer. Okay, the next question, actually, I'll combine a couple of them. So um, what criteria do you use for patient release post-administration of lutetium-177 PSMA therapy? And a similar question was asking about using port for administration of the dose. Um, so these are outpatient procedures. There's no need to keep them as an inpatient um, unless there's some kind of other medical thing. The radiation is not sufficient where we need to do dosimetry or anything else like that. Now, if you're in some clinical trial where you're giving much higher levels of radiation. That's not what we're talking about. But for our 200 millicuries, for both PSMA and Lutathera, they're outpatients. The MIBG is an inpatient. That actually, you need to calculate the release rate. Um, but I would say for the sake of time, we're not going to talk about that. You should not use the, the HEMOC port. Don't do that. All right. <clears throat> um, so... You touched on this a little bit, Dr. Parent. So the question is, is the physician doing anything during the infusion or is he or she just available if the tech has a problem? Um, it depends on the person. Uh, so the, there's a couple of things that I'm doing. So one, I'm consenting the patient, answering any questions they have. Two, I am watching the rate of infusion and I'm making sure that we're at a good rate and I'm monitoring that. Um, I'm checking the radiation. Uh, we have a Geiger counter. It's at the foot of the bed and I'm just monitoring that. But I'm also talking to the patient, making them feel comfortable with everything that's going on. Um, you know, ultimately after the first few minutes, you're probably, as a physician, you're probably not really needed there. But if something's gonna happen, like if they're having some adverse event, it's gonna happen in, PSMA, I've never really seen a real adverse event during it. 
But for Lunathera, it's going to happen that first five to seven minutes. After about 10 minutes, most of the radiation has been going to be delivered to the patient. And if they're going to have something, that would have already happened. Um, but you are there basically to make sure if there's an adverse event, you're able to manage it. Because in theory, anything could happen and you need to be responsible for it. And so that's really why the physician is there. Now, there's some places that say, you're available. Does that mean you're in the room? Or if you're just able to be, uh, you know, they can grab you. Uh, I'm going to say that's going to depend on the practice. For where we practice, we're in the room for the, at least the first 10 minutes. Great. And also, it sounds like to be an enforcer and taskmaster about not moving their arms and distracting yes. from sports and some social media discussions. Um, so there was just a couple more questions similar to the one about the port. So can you clarify why a central line should not be used for infusion? Um, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot. I, I mean, I can give an answer, but I don't know if uh, Dr. Scorsio would like to answer this. Okay. Uh, so with ports, uh, I don't mess with them unless I need to. Uh, so you're giving radiation, right? And, and, and the less tubing you have, is going to be better. So there's a lot of things that you can get fibrin clots, you can do a lot of other stuff like that. I mean, in theory, is there any problem using a port? Probably not, but you're giving a large amount of radiation. If you miss the port, if there's other stuff going on, I just think that you have a greater chance of something going wrong and not realizing it um, versus uh, an IV lane, an IV line. Um, I, I just think overall, th there's a chance of just having something screw up that you're not watching. And then the last thing you want is to have somebody having some necrosis around that area. I, I just think it's a bad idea to, to do that. All right. Well, so we're a little past six o'clock. Um, so we have a few more questions and there will likely be more that come in, um, but just in this sake of time and to save our speakers who are probably hoarse at this point, um, please, please feel free to send us additional questions, which we will submit to them. And, and then we will provide with the webinar when it gets posted on the ACR website. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Escorcia, Dr. Parent for your fantastic talks and for enlightening us all in this difficult to understand topic. And thanks, thank you to the audience for joining us today. And, and please feel free to join the um, upcoming webinars in future months. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank